Thank you. you. may be seated. Well, we have a very interesting passage before us tonight. It is the passage in Acts chapter 12, verses 20 through 23. I've entitled the message, The Worms Crawl In, The Worms Crawl Out. Worms in the Bible. A very fascinating passage because it gives to us some horrifying pictures of things that lie ahead for the wicked. Acts chapter 12, we'll be looking at verses 20 through 23. And you recall that the title for the message last week was actually taken from the book of Ecclesiastes because of what happened to the soldiers is a very sobering reminder to us of how that principle works. The message last week was taken in an evil snare. That comes from Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 12. For man also knoweth not his time, as the fishes that are taken in an evil net, and as the birds that are caught in the snare, so are the sons of men snared in an evil time, when it falleth suddenly upon them. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we pray for your word as it goes forth tonight, that we'll understand how what happened to the soldiers and then what happened to Herod is a reminder to us of how you sovereignly work all things together, things that are for the good of those who are your own children, things that are judgments upon those who are not. And so, Father, we pray for your blessings on your word as it goes forth tonight, that it will not return void, but that it will accomplish that which you please, and that it will prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I want to set the stage for the message tonight by emphasizing that principle that we saw last week. Because Herod is killing some men, and Herod himself is about to be killed. He was a brutal man. He killed in brutal ways. God is going to kill him in a particularly brutal way, as we will see tonight. You know, we can carefully plan our own lives. We can do all the healthy things. We can eat right. We can sleep appropriate amounts of time. We can avoid immoral things. We can abstain from alcohol and tobacco and drugs. We can avoid evil companions. We can work hard. We can save money. We can follow godly principles and do right. We can be rich and powerful and at the height of human accomplishment. Certainly Herod had all of those things at the end of his life other than the things that relate to godliness. But he had everything. But you know, we can still be surprised by death when it comes unexpectedly. Disease, car wrecks, terrorist activities, mistakes by other people, poisonous animals and plants, criminals, fire, tornadoes, earthquakes, drowning, explosives, innocently being in the wrong place at the wrong time, genetic defects that we did not know that we inherited, government leaders bringing persecution, supernatural judgments on a nation of which we are part, and a host of other nets and snares that come upon us in an evil time. God controls the time and place of our life, and God controls the time and place of our death, all according to his purposes. I want to read you a few other verses out of Ecclesiastes because... It helps us perhaps to understand why these two incidents are set back to back in the book of Acts. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to break down, and a time to build up, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain 
from embracing. A time to get and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to rend and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. What profit hath he that worketh in that wherein he laboreth? Ecclesiastes reminds us of the temporality of life, the temporal nature of all that we see around us today. It's a good book to meditate on when you begin to feel fat and happy and sassy, when you think everything's going your way, when you think that nothing could possibly go wrong, go wrong, go wrong, <laughs> when you get stuck in that rut. Ecclesiastes 6 reminds us, doesn't matter how much you have or accomplish, how little it is worth in light of eternity, unless it is used for the glory of God. Ecclesiastes 6.3 If a man beget an hundred children and live many years, so that the days of his years be many, and his soul be not filled with good, and also that he have no burial, I say that an untimely birth is better than he. For he cometh in with vanity, and departeth in darkness, and his name shall be covered with darkness. Moreover, he hath not seen the son, that is, the stillborn child, nor known anything, this hath more rest than the other. Yea, though he live a thousand years twice told, yet hath he seen no good. Do not all go to one place. Chapter 8. Because to every purpose there is time and judgment. Therefore the misery of man is great upon him. For he knoweth not that which shall be. For who can tell him when it shall be? Verse 8. What an important verse to remember here. There is no man that hath power over the spirit to retain the spirit, neither hath he power in the day of death. And there is no discharge in that war Neither shall wickedness deliver those that are given to it. Down to verse 8 to 14. There is a vanity which is done upon the earth, that there be just men unto whom it happeneth according to the work of the wicked. Again, there be wicked men to whom it happeneth according to the work of the righteousness, uh, of the righteous. I said that this also is vanity. My printer did not work very well, so it's difficult for me to read this. All things come alike to all. There is one event to the righteous and to the wicked, and to the good, and the clean, and to the unclean, to him that sacrificeth and to him that sacrificeth not. As is the good, so is the sinner, and he that sweareth as he that feareth an oath. This is an evil among all things that are done under the sun, that there is one event unto all. Yea, also the heart of the sons of men is full of evil, and madness is in their heart while they live, and after that they go to the dead. For to him that is joined to all the living there is hope, for a living dog is better than a dead lion. 
for the living know that they shall die. But the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. Chapter 9 tells us that the sovereign hand of God uses both time and chance. We look at it as something that just happened. But God uses time and chance. Ecclesiastes 9, beginning in verse 11. I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happeneth to them all. Verse 12. For man also knoweth not his time. This is the verse that we took for our theme verse to describe what happened last week. As the fishes that are taken in an evil net, and as the birds that are caught in the snare, so are the sons of men snared in an evil time when it falleth suddenly upon them. Folks, I hope that you are paying attention to what is going on around us in this country. We saw in the text last week that there was a supernatural blindness that covered a very large physical area about a city block. We saw the supernatural blindness covered an extensive period of time. We saw that the supernatural blindness was with precise timing to fulfill God's purposes, one, in deliverance, two, in judgment, on a specific group of men. For that timing and execution of judgment was determined by God, not by the extent of the wickedness of those particular soldiers. We saw that both judgment and deliverance, God can use pagans and God can use natural means. We gave illustrations of those. We saw that the same darkness and blindness in the Old Testament for one was actually light for another with the Shekinah glory standing between Egypt and Israel the night before the crossing of the Red Sea. We saw the physical blindness as a type and a picture of spiritual darkness. We saw that blindness and darkness and the healing of that blindness and darkness is the proof that Jesus is the Messiah. We saw that blindness is a picture of the judgment of God. We saw that in one case there was a group of jailers that was killed because a prisoner was released by God. And in another case, a jailer was not only spared from death, but was saved and his entire family because the prisoners did not leave, though God opened their jail in Acts chapter 16. And we noted in passing, as we ended the message last week, the time and chance happened to them all. Herod was, in that first passage, being set up for the slaughter that we see tonight. And we closed with two identical verses from Proverbs and one verse from Amos. The wise will hear and understand. A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. Exact same wording stated twice in the book of Proverbs. God wants to draw our attention to it. And then Amos 5.13, Therefore the prudent shall keep silence in that time, for it is an evil time. That brings us to our text tonight. Acts chapter 12, verse 20. And Herod was highly displeased with them of Tyre and Sidon, but they came with one accord. Oh, I cannot hardly read this to him. And having made Blastus the king's chamberlain their friend, desired peace, because their country was nourished by the king's country. 
And upon a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne and made an oration unto them. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a god and not of a man. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him, because he gave not God the glory, and he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. Shocking occurrence. An occurrence that occurred in front of many people. An occurrence that occurred because a man did not give God the glory that God deserves. You know, God set Herod up to go from Jerusalem to Caesarea, which is on the coast. That was a strictly Roman city of great wealth, active in commerce. A city that was filled with multiple carnal pleasures. It was a resort town. It was 47 miles from Jerusalem. This is not the same city as Caesarea Philippi at the headwaters of the Jordan River up in the country of Dan. It's about that Caesarea Philippi is about 120 miles from Jerusalem. But Herod had decided apparently to have some fun after his unsettling experience at Jerusalem. So he did what many of us do. He headed for the beach. Caesarea was on the main highway from Tyre to Egypt, and therefore it was a good location for the intersection between Herod and the messengers from Tyre. We've studied in some detail in the past the way in which God directs steps for his divine appointments. We already studied that in great detail when we looked at Philip in the Ethiopian eunuch. The precise timing, the precise location, the precise intersection of our lives with the lives of other people. But God also has divine appointments for the wicked whom he has chosen to judge. Caesarea was the city from which Paul left to go to Tarsus. Caesarea was the city where Cornelius lived. Caesarea was the city where the Gentiles first heard the gospel. Caesarea was the city from which Paul embarked on his enforced journey to Rome as a prisoner. We're not told the specifics about how the people of Tyre and Sidon had displeased Herod. In the ancient world, Tyre and Sidon were powerful city-states in their own right, but they came under the control of Rome at the time of Herod. Thus, they were dependent upon the Roman leaders in the area for their trade, for their commerce, for their food supply, for their political influence, for their freedom of movement, for their legal rights, for their tax breaks, and other things that they had enjoyed when they were free, sovereign city-states. But in some way they had displeased Herod. They were also people who knew how to pull political strings and arrange a meeting with Herod to pacify his vanity and to soothe his anger. They played their inside man card with Blastus the king's chamberlain. That's a term referred to in the Old Testament to one who is a eunuch. The word literally means one who's been castrated. The chamberlain here. The chamberlain was often the eunuch who was in charge of a harem. A chamberlain was also one who was often, as a eunuch, in charge of the treasury, such as the eunuch who met Philip on the road to Ethiopia, or Erastus, the chamberlain of the city of Corinth. A chamberlain was also an officer in charge of the royal court and palace etiquette. And eventually that title morphed into what we might call the chamber valet of the king. He was trusted in the king's bedroom. He knew everything that went on there. Knowing Herod's penchant for moral depravity and his greed for money, it is possible that these messengers had cut some kind of a deal with Blastus to satisfy Herod's carnal desires for women and money, and thus arranged the meeting so that they might appease his third area of carnal weakness, which was his absolute arrogant pride. Herod obviously was pleased to come and to give a speech. We see in the passage that he's all decked out in his finery. He's showing off his talents to a very fawning audience. I think it's rather interesting that the audience was not judged for what they said. It is the voice of a god, not of a man. 
It was Herod who was judged for taking the praise as though it belonged to him because of his talents and gifts. It's also interesting to note the order of the judgment as it is stated here in the text. The text says that the worms ate him before he died. His fawning audience got to see the worms eating him as he lay writhing on the platform. God hit him with worms. He didn't die and then get eaten by worms. That happens to everybody. It would not have been mentioned in the text if it were any other way than different than the norm. This was a precisely timed judgment of God. Now stop and think about it for a minute. Can you imagine the horror of Herod and the audience as a worm crawls out of his ear? Then a worm crawls out of his nose. Then a worm eats its way through his neck from the inside. And then he begins to feel worms eating their way out through his abdomen and he rips off his clothes in pain. As he screams and writhes on stage, as a terrified hush settles over the crowd. He vomits blood and loses everything in his stomach and in his intestinal tract and dies in utter humiliation in public. And all of that because he took glory for himself that belonged to God. And immediately, this didn't take a period of time. It wasn't something he saw coming. It wasn't something he felt before it happened. He's giving an oration, they cry. It's the voice of a God, not of a man. And he sucks it in. And as he does so, immediately, the angel of the Lord smote him. Immediately, because he gave not God the glory, and he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. In that order. You know, it's always a dangerous thing to take glory for ourselves when glory always belongs to God. For example, King Nebuchadnezzar. This afternoon I had the privilege of previewing a video on the book of Daniel. And they enact out the various prophecies and the various events that occur in the book of Daniel. And one of those is with King Nebuchadnezzar, who decided to take glory for himself. And he said, is not this great Babylon that I have built? It was only a year after he had received a vision from God, warning him of the danger of what would happen if he took glory for himself. The vision of the great tree that had spread over all the earth and the birds lodged in its branches and the beasts of the field sheltered under its shade. A tree that had many leaves, a tree that had much fruit. And a watcher comes down from heaven and says, cut it down. Bind the root and the stump with a band of iron and brass until seven times be passed over. And Nebuchadnezzar is troubled, and he calls Daniel in, and he says, explain this dream to me. And Daniel says, I wish that were going to happen to your enemies, not to you, but you are the tree. And because of your arrogance and pride, God is going to cut you down. He's going to restore your kingdom as soon as you recognize that there is a God in heaven who is worthy to be worshipped and nobody else. And so Daniel says, I counsel you to repent from your wickedness. Twelve months go by. Nebuchadnezzar is walking in the hanging gardens of Babylon, this, this beautiful rooftop gardens that he had built, where he had all these luscious and beautiful trees and plants, and he's overlooking the city, this magnificent city. Huge walls that the enemy could not conquer. Chariots could race around the top of those walls. 
And in a moment of pride, he puffs himself up and says, Is not this great Babylon that I have built? And immediately, a voice comes from heaven. Immediately, a voice says to him, Time for you to be an animal. And for seven years, he crawls around on the ground like an animal eating grass. And his hair grows long and straggly, and his fingernails grow, grow like the claws of a bird. And his brilliance turns into animal instinct. At the end of that passage we read, The same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from men and did eat grass as oxen. And his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his hairs were grown like eagle's feathers, and his nails like bird claws. And at the end of the days I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned to me, and I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever and ever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the armies of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? At the same time my reason returned unto me, and for the glory of my kingdom mine honor and brightness returned unto me. And my counselors and my lords sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom an excellent majesty was added unto me. Now Nebuchadnezzar, I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all whose works are truth, and his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride, he is able to abase. Isn't it interesting? Here's Nebuchadnezzar. God judges him for just seven years and humbles him and his kingdom is restored. A much more powerful king than King Herod. King Herod, a petty king. God judges him with instantaneous, painful, ugly death. God knows the heart. None of God's judgments are unfair. God's judgments are tailored precisely for the individual and precisely in such a way that his eternal purposes are perfectly accomplished with no mistakes. Nebuchadnezzar lived. Herod died. As Herod is being judged here, he's actually getting a brief foretaste of hell into which he is about to plunge. Did you know that fireproof worms are part of hell? Let me say that again. Fireproof worms are part of hell. We don't often think of them in relation to hell, but listen to what Jesus said. In Mark chapter 9, beginning in verse 43, And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. Where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire 
and if we didn't get it the first two times, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Our Lord Jesus Christ is not merely talking about Gehenna, the valley of the sons of Hinnom outside the city of Jerusalem, though that was a visible picture. He was talking about when you die, where do you go? He gave them a visible picture with that garbage dump where there was always a smoldering fire and where it was filled with worms eating rot. But he told us that hell is like that. The worms in Gehenna died, but in hell their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Herod got a graphic experience and picture, and the people who were watching Herod, hopefully learning a lesson, got a graphic picture of what Herod was about to experience in hell. As we look at this passage, physical worms that gnaw on your body in the grave are merely visible reminders of the eternal biting and gnawing and voracious worms that will eat on you as you burn in hell throughout all of eternity. Believe me, you don't want to go there. You know, Jesus, in quoting that, or speaking in Mark chapter 9, is actually quoting a passage out of Isaiah. This is Isaiah chapter 55, verse 24. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. For their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. You might not have known it, but Jesus was quoting Isaiah the prophet when he reminded those to whom he was speaking in the Gospel of Mark about what hell is like. There will also be a judging and a judgment of Satan in hell where worms can eat eternally and not consume just like the fire that burns eternally and does not consume. Isaiah chapter 14 is one of the great passages that describes for us the fall of Satan and describes for us the reasons for it and the judgment that will follow. Isaiah chapter 14, beginning in verse 9. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. All they shall speak and say unto thee, Art thou also become as weak as we? Art thou become like unto us? Thy pomp is brought down to the grave, and the noise of the viols. The worm is spread under thee, and the worm covereth thee. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mountain of the congregation. That's the temple mount in the sides of the north. He sits there now in the gold dome mosque. There rests on that place. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. The five great I wills of Satan are listed for us here in Isaiah chapter 14. Every one of them is a manifestation of precisely the same sin that we see in Herod. The sin of arrogant, self-willed pride. God hates pride. And the description of what will happen to Satan 
includes being underlain with worms and covered with worms and being eaten by worms for all of eternity in the midst of a fire that does not consume. There is no annihilation of either men or demons in Scripture. There is eternal punishment, eternal torment, eternal filth, eternal burning, and fireproof worms. Dear people, that's the way the Scripture describes it. You don't want to go there. When you think about it, what happened to Herod is perhaps the most horrifying show-and-tell lesson that God could have given to warn about usurping his glory. That's what will happen to men and fallen angels who rebel against him and take the glory for themselves. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not God the glory and he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and its power, its graphic power to remind us that judgment is coming. Father, there are people, perhaps some who on occasion attend this church, who are headed for the place where the fire is not quenched and where the worm dieth not. Too late to change course once death occurs. Too late to find the exit door once you have entered the one-way revolving door that leads to the lake of fire. Oh, Father, I pray that if there is anyone here tonight, anyone who is watching this broadcast, anyone who at a later date will hear this message, that you will place the horror of darkness upon them until they cry out, until they scream out for your help, for your salvation in Jesus. For they are headed for a place of darkness, a place of what the scripture calls thick darkness and fire and smoke and being covered and eaten by worms. Father, help them to see that that is true. And that is what is coming for those who are not saved. We pray, Father, that you will take your word as it has gone forth this night, that you will glorify your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is the Savior from all of that, the one who gave his life and died in our place, the one who gives joy and peace and brightness and light and life the one who has promised the bliss of heaven to those who have placed their faith in him. Use your word, Father, as you see fit to the glory of your Son, Jesus Christ, for we pray it in his name. Amen. Our closing hymn tonight is number 370, Rejoice 